Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is, for those of you that don't know me, is Dr. Cormac McSparren. Thank you very much to Deborah uh, for the introduction. Uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, early Bronze Age burials, uh, a, a very rich burial tradition that's over uh, quite a few hundred years in uh, sort of uh, second or third millennium BC uh, in Ireland. And I'm going to use those burials also as a way of uh, looking at society and the way that uh, society was structured uh, back in the early Bronze Age. And uh, hopefully towards the end, I'll have enough time to widen the discussion out a wee bit, uh, look at the sort of factors that lead to the, the, the changes in early Bronze Age society and see how those relate uh, not just in Ireland, but also out uh, into uh, Britain, even a little bit into Europe uh, as well. So uh, uh, hopefully this uh, I'll, I'll manage to fit this all into an hour or not too much longer. I, uh, I sort of did a dry run last night and videoed it just in case there were network problems that had come in uh, in an hour and three minutes. But I was sort of talking like an auctioneer for most of it, uh, trying to squeeze it in. Uh, so it, we might run just a wee wee bit over that, uh, if, if, if you don't mind. Uh, but uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, if, uh, if, if they want to, 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 to make them at the end, that's fine. Or if they want to send me an email or something like that afterwards, that's brilliant as well. I'll try and answer them uh, as best I can. And if there is somebody, something that somebody uh, it really, really is, is, I haven't been clear, or, or if somebody can't hear me, or if there's a problem with the, the sound, uh, as sometimes happens, if uh, people would tell me, I'll maybe try and make some uh, adaptions or move closer to the microphone or something like that. So uh, anyway, I just want to open a wee bit and talk for a minute or two uh, before talking really about the, the, the early Bronze Age burials and society, the main topic. I want to just discuss it for a wee minute or two how archaeologists think uh, about society, uh, because it kind of underpins a lot of what I'm going to say. Uh, Archaeologists uh, really derive a lot of their conceptual sort of background on this from, from anthropology. Uh, in particular, a couple of uh, very famous anthropologists from the mid 20th century in America, uh, Service and Salons. And they really uh, built what you might describe as a typology of societies, or maybe you could describe it as a toolkit, really, for looking at different types of societies and seeing how they slot into a series of, of categories. Uh, uh, Salons uh, produced a sort of a, a scheme which was based around the idea of a tribe, uh, band, well, a band is the smallest sort of type of society, tribes and a, a larger, uh, sort of more cohesive unit, uh, which had some internal structures, some internal institutions. And then the other two big ones were the chiefdom, which had a really uh, well-defined uh, elite whose position was, was secured by inheritance rather than personal attributes or abilities. And then, of course, moving into the medieval period or the modern period, really from the classical period onwards, really, you have a state-type structure, something which we would recognise as a, as, as a country or a nation today. Uh, Elman Service, his, his colleague, uh, really come up with a, a very similar sort of series of uh, uh, of, of, of societal descriptions, but instead of uh, categories, he really thought of as a continuum. And he talked about non-ranked societies, what we might call egalitarian societies. And then he talked about ranked societies. And these are societies uh, in which, a bit like the chiefdom, uh, status is, uh, is, is either institutionally backed, uh, some office that you achieve, or else uh, is backed by uh, your family lineage is backed by who your ancestors were. And then he has an additional category which describes the most advanced chiefdoms and, 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 and classical and medieval states, which is a sort of stratified society where there's a, a very uh, well-defined uh, distinction between uh, the different social groups and where the elite social group pretty much control what you, what you would call sort of classic, classic sort of uh, economic terms, the means of production. Uh, and that's the most sophisticated type of state. And this is the sort of typology which uh, archaeologists and anthropologists use when talking about ancient uh, societies. Uh, very, influ very influential in, in American archaeology, this way of speaking, to a certain extent in European and Irish and British archaeology as well, especially through the 60s, 70s and 80s. Some postmodernist uh, type thinkers think of it as a bit too 
uh, mechanistic. But really, they, they, they've made, I suppose, a valid criticism. But of course, like most postmodernists, they put nothing in its place. So uh, we're, we're, we're stuck with it until someone comes up with anything better. Uh, it does seem to work reasonably well. Uh, also, because we're talking about burials, I wouldn't mind just mentioning a little bit about what archaeologists think of death and funerary ritual. Uh, this tends to drive most archaeologists to sleep, so I'm not going to talk about it for too long. But uh, the, the, until about the 1960s, archaeologists tended to use a sort of a common sense approach uh, to talking about death and funerary rituals. Or alternative faith, they didn't just use common sense. Uh, they would sort of uh, look at classical illusions or biblical allegories uh, to sort of explain what they saw in the ancient world and how they interpreted it and how they related to the types of societies that they were studying. This changed in the 60s. There were a number of, uh, uh, of archaeologists, anthropologists and other sort of social theorists who realised that, in fact, the, the sort of the common sense approach has just perpetuated a, a very much European or North American way of looking at ancient societies and, and classical and biblical analogies were, were had really just fed into the, the Western way of thinking about societies and they used uh, ethnography basically uh, to look at the the, the full uh, smorgasbord uh, use that horrible phrase of uh, social practice and funerary practice that there was in the world. And then once they looked at the, 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 the wider the, the wider sort of uh, canvas of, of, of funerary practice and its relationship to society, it become realized by people like Lewis Binford, who was a very famous uh, uh, archaeologist working in the 60s, 70s and 80s, that there was a direct relationship between the type of society and the type of funerary rituals. He came up with a number of different complex uh, proposals, but essentially they all organ were all organized around the concept that the more complex the society, the more complex the available set of funerary rituals would have to be to reflect uh, the complexity of that society. And he also suggested, which seems like a, a, an obvious point, but uh, a point which needed to be explicitly defined, that in most societies, higher status groups would have higher status burials. Uh, <clears throat> this is an idea which is come in for a bit of criticism, uh, especially from British archaeologists since the 1980s onwards. Uh, some of that criticism was very well made. Mike Parker Pearson, who some of you would be aware of, uh, did an excellent study of graveyards, uh, Victorian and early 20th century graveyards in Cambridge. And he noted that while it was true to say in the Victorian period that uh, there was a direct relationship between social complexity and social status uh, in grave, uh, in grave uh, markers, uh, funerary monuments, uh, funerary, wider funerary ritual. Uh, so the, the mill owner had uh, a great big uh, sort of an, uh, edifice and the, uh, the, the, the pauper was lucky to have a wooden cross. Uh, but uh, Mike Parker Pearson also noticed that then sometime in the early 20th century, there was a, a, a sort of an egalitarianism a sort of crept into to, to, to burial practice. Uh, it became gauche or unfashionable to have huge uh, ostentatious uh, burial monuments and there was actually a, a tremendous uniformity or relative uniformity anyway in burial monuments amongst uh, the, the, the all, all different social groups. Uh, Mike Parker Pearson thought that the First World War was probably responsible for this and he saw a new ideology, effectively an ideology masking uh, uh, social distinction being imposed on funerary ritual, an idea that we're you know, we're, so we're all in this together, at least we're all in death together, being imposed uh, upon a funerary ritual, which was not necessary, which meant that funerary ritual was no longer a direct representation of society. These ideas have been taken on board uh, by, the, by, by archaeology generally. And uh, Lewis Binford and his school of, of thinking has not really been thrown out. Uh, but I uh, shall we say a cautionary note has been added that when you look at uh, a period of time, don't or, 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 or a set of burial practices in a particular society, don't look at it in isolation, just a small period, uh, an isolated study. You must widen out and look at other socio-environmental and uh, economic factors and also take a, 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 maybe a little bit of a longer a chronological uh, sweep so as to be able to properly contextualise the evidence you're looking at in the way that uh, Mike Par Parker Pearson uh, did. Uh, a couple of other very quick ideas I want to talk about before I actually get stuck into the burials. Uh, Lewis Binford had great ideas, but he was difficult to 
operationalize, if you like. It was difficult to link his ideas to archaeology on the ground, the things that were discovered by survey or excavation or that were in museum catalogues. Uh, so uh, a number of other people had to build on his ideas and make them work, essentially. Uh, Tainter, a great uh, archaeologist from the 1970s, uh, uh, did a lot of really good work in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and still going, uh, related to the idea of uh, effort or energy as a concept that could be used to even out all the different categories of things you were working at or looking at. So you might be trying to say, you know, I've got a, a burial marker, which is impressive. I've got a set of grave goods. I've got a particular treatment of the body. How do I relate these all together and come up with a cumulative idea of how, of, of how important this burial is or isn't? Well, one way of looking at it was the amount of effort or energy that was put into it. Uh, that always will not necessarily come out with a purely mathematical idea, like the number of watts or something like that you've put in. But starting to think that way allowed people to move a lot more down the line of being able to relate things which were categorically different, like, say, jewellery and stonework uh, on, on, on a burial. Uh, the other sort of ideas were people like Peoples and Cuss, who are, uh, again, so 70s and 80s anthropologically inspired archaeologists, uh, and they, what they did was they, they, they looked specifically at the chiefdom group that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, Marshall Salon's work on chiefdoms. And they decided to come up with a set of what they called correlates, using the sort of jargon laden uh, 1970s and 80s uh, archaeology, correlates, things that, uh, that, that you would expect to find if you were looking for burials amongst uh, chiefdom type societies. And they come up with three or four. Oh, sorry, just someone raised their hand there. I want to try and find out what this is. Uh, hello, Jill. Is that someone trying to get in? I'm just going to try and find out uh, what can this you hear is. Me? Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? I can, yes. Hi, I just, I think you've. You've not started the slideshow. You've just referred to slides beforehand. We're still all looking at the first page. Is that correct? Oh, now that shouldn't be the case. I seem to have skipped through the slides okay. Can you see the slides moving now? We're still on the, the burials and society intro, intro page. Oh, no, that shouldn't be the case at all. <laughs> oh, dear. You sh do I have to share each individual slide? Can you I think you need to start slideshow somehow. Uh, can you see a, sli a different slide now? Yes, we can now. Right. I think That's you need bad. to start slideshow. <laughs> there must be a start button somewhere. I, as this is the first, I, I normally use Microsoft Teams. And uh, right, sorry about that. Right, I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm going to just quickly show you these slides. Right, sorry. Right, you can see how archaeologists mm -hmm. think about society, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 the chart uh, which I intended to show you, the, the diagram which I intended to show you, of different types of societies, and the picture of Marshall Salons and Element Service. And these are the band, tribe, uh, ignore the two little ones there, chiefdom and state, and then non-ranked, ranked and stratified societies. Uh, uh, Salons thought of bands as very simple societies, tribes as more complex societies, larger with uh, internal institutions to give them cohesion, and chiefdoms as, as, as uh, again, larger, more sophisticated groups which had a formal aristocracy within them. And, and uh, service uh, did the same kind of thing, but instead of having different categories, he had a sort of a sliding scale of, of ranking, really. Non-ranked societies, which were societies where uh, hierarchy was purely down to your personal qualities. Uh, so if you were charismatic or a good warrior or a good toolmaker, uh, uh, ranked societies uh, were societies where uh, your, your status was buttressed by something, either a formal institutional office in the society or alternatively, uh, your inheritance, uh, your family background was giving you rank. And then stratified societies which were societies where there was a very significant uh, a gap between the different social classes and where the means of production, uh, that is uh, raw materials, agriculture, everything really was controlled by the elite. I'm now going to move on to share the next slide. Uh, 
which I think, uh, can you see this? Uh, how archaeologists think yes. about death? Yes. Uh, this was uh, uh, Lewis Binford, who I mentioned, and his uh, relationship of uh, complexity of society and complexity of funerary, funerary rituals, uh, critiqued uh, by Mike Parker Pearson and his work on Cambridge burials, suggesting that the First World War put an ideological cloak, if you like, over uh, representation of status in the funerary ritual. Then uh, uh, I mentioned Tainter, uh, who uh, really used energy input as a way of evaluating categorically different aspects of ritual practice. Uh, and then uh, Peoples and Cuss, who uh, took the idea of the chiefdom uh, and ran with it. And I think this is where I, 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 I left uh, earlier. I'm actually going to try a slightly different version of sharing. I wonder, I'm going to share this. Uh, can someone tell me, has the slide just changed again? Yes. Right. I think there's two types of share I've discovered. So I, I, I'll say what I'm going to change again and to tell me if it doesn't change. So Peoples and Cuss uh, really took the ideas of Binford and tried to make them operational for things to look for in, in, in the field. And they suggested that really uh, with a chiefdom, you should see three broad groups of burials. You should see a lower class of burials, which they called a subordinate class. And they should be when I say mainly ordered according to sex or age, that means that sex or age should be the uh, should, should should be treated differently in the lower class of burial, sex and or age. So young people may be treated differently from old people uh, or middle aged people. Men may be treated differently from women. They suggest that there should be a, a higher class, uh, sort of a middle and upper middle class, if you like, in modern terms where all age groups and sexes should be fairly evenly represented because if you're part of that semi-elite group, everyone has status, whether they're young, old, male, female, uh, no matter what their sort of uh, personal, physical background, if you like, because their status is coming to some extent from their position within society. And then uh, they suggested that in most chieftains, there would be an elite class, which they call an apical class, uh, where there would be, uh, which would be composed mainly or exclusively of, of, with, of adult males, and where there would be symbols of wealth and power that are appropriate for that society uh, in, 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 in or associated with their graves or uh, funerary ritual. Now I'm about to change slide again. Has it, has, it, has, it, has it changed? Yes. Can you see a picture of an eel? Yes. Right. Uh, I'm just going to <clears throat> contextualize very, very quickly in five minutes, just with a few slides, uh, the periods uh, running up to the Irish uh, early Bronze Age uh, and uh, just say a little bit about the nature of society from the sort of way we've been talking uh, before speaking about uh, the early Bronze Age. There has been settlement in Ireland, as you probably all know, uh, from about 8000 BC. Uh, prior to that, there may have been settlement in Ireland. Uh, the ice caps retreated about 17,000 BC, roughly-ish. There may well have been settlement in Ireland before that stage in the Paleolithic, but the ice has almost certainly destroyed pretty much all evidence for it. Uh, by 9000 BC, the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Drift, was operating nicely, and we have definite evidence of settlement from shortly after that. These early settlers were uh, hunter-gatherers, and there's a direct link uh, between uh, social, uh, social the, the nature of your society and the economic base. That's something really that uh, Marx pointed out and other people have built on subsequently. You're not going to have a, a, a huge uh, classical empire uh, based on a subsistence hunter gathering. And there's a direct relationship between the two. If you have an advanced society, you have an, an advanced uh, uh, economic strategy, an advanced uh, way of exploiting the, 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 the landscape. Uh, so hunter gatherers uh, had a simple, uh, but very effective uh, means of subsistence. Uh, they did not have a, a difficult life. Uh, it was a bit Garden of Eden-like in some respects. They had dozens and dozens of uh, resources which they could exploit. If one particular resource goes that year, if the crab apples aren't very good, well, who cares? Because they've only got another 67 different foodstuffs uh, to, to exploit. Uh, so these societies, uh, the 
that tend to be related to, the, well, the size of the population tends to be closely related to the carrying capacity of the land. Uh, fertility is relatively low. Women tend to feed their children for quite a long time. In these fairly mobile hunter-gathering societies, we know that from ethnographic parallels, and they really just replace themselves each generation or very slow growth. So in a society like this, uh, there isn't a lot of craft specialization. People generally make their own things, use their own things. They're very, very competent at doing it. Uh, there is also not much, there is hierarchy, but there isn't hierarchy that's based on anything apart from personal attributes. All human societies have hierarchy. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there's been a, a, a recent sort of thinker, you probably know on, on, on YouTube and the TV, has been making a lot about all human societies having hierarchy. He leaves out half of the half of the story. All human societies have hierarchy, but up until a few thousand years ago, all hierarchy was based on personal attributes. It was not based on inheritance or or, or lineage or, 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 or things that have happened for centuries beforehand, building someone's status in their family. It was purely for most of human society based on personal attributes. Uh, charisma, strength, ability as a, as, a, as, a, as a negotiator or as a hunter or something like that. Uh, new slide, has it come up? Uh, yes. Big change uh, around about 3900 BC, give or take. Uh, a, a few decades, farming uh, arrived in the Irish landscape. It spreads, <coughs> excuse me, like a rash over, over the country over the next couple of hundred years. By 3700 BC, every hole in the hedge seems to have a farmstead associated with it. Uh, with these farmers come a package of technology and concepts, which archaeologists refer to as the Neolithic or New Stone Age. And these societies are sedentary. They grow crops and these crops allow the possibility of a surplus. Uh, you can grow more crops than you actually need to feed yourself or your family. And this surplus has another couple of effects. It leads to the possibility, in fact, certainly in Neolithic societies, of rapid population increase, which is probably part of the reason why uh, uh, the, these farmsteads seem to spread all over uh, Ireland within, uh, uh, well, a few generations, really. Uh, certainly at most a couple of hundred years, all of the good land certainly in Ireland is being exploited by Neolithic farmers. Estimates of population density that have been made in recent years from excavated evidence suggest probably something like a million people uh, living in Ireland around 3700 BC. So a huge increase, maybe a 20-fold increase from the number of people who were living uh, on, on, on the island when uh, it was uh, hunter-gatherer uh, communities. Uh, the, these, uh, as well as allowing population increase, it allows specialization. Uh, specialization means that people don't have to spend all day farming or all their time farming. They can afford to spend most of their time uh, developing a craft and they get their food through trading their crafted products with, with, with farmers. Uh, so you can just see bottom left, sorry, bottom right hand corner, an absolutely beautiful uh, flint knife. Uh, from uh, Tirnoni Portal Tomb, which we excavated a number of years ago and hopefully go to publication in, in for, for a very few weeks or months. And uh, uh, you can see that someone has made that who has uh, wonderful abilities as a flint knapper. That's not, the, not something that you learn in a few weeks or months. That's something which takes years of apprenticeship uh, to become that good. There were other crafts as well. It's easy enough archaeologically to detect uh, polished stone axe manufacture and, and obviously very competent uh, expert potters. There are lots of other ones which archaeology can't regularly detect, like wicker makers and carpenters and, 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 and all sorts of leather workers, other sort of craft workers whose raw materials uh, will not last for 6,000 years in, in the ground. But another upshot of this is, is that you can no longer live in a small band type society of maybe 50 or 70 or 100 people. Uh, with all those different crafts, uh, and all these different people needing to integrate together, you need larger social basic units. So the idea of a, of, of a segment uh, of maybe 500 persons uh, and these segments clubbing together to make a, a tribe which could have up to maybe two or 3,000, maybe more uh, people in it over a fairly extended geographical area with some institutions to tie the tribe together, uh, regular markets, for instance, marriage institutions, medicine clubs, warfare societies, that's, you know, the, the, that, that sort of thing. 
uh, sort of tag together in organic solidarity, the uh, or mechanical solidarity rather, is the sort of technical term. These institutions to tie the uh, the, the the trade together as a sort of the, the neolithic way of life. Uh, with regards to hierarchy. <laughs> there are definitely, there's definitely, again, a hierarchy and there are definitely tribal institutions and people may make their way up a semi-tribal hierarchy based on notches on their belt, so to speak. You know, if, 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 you've, if you've killed someone from a neighbouring tribe or if you've hunted a particular type of beast or if you have uh, achieved certain other things, you may get up the pecking order. But it's a pecking order which is not based, again, on, on rigid uh, categorical distinctions. It's based on personal attributes. Uh, they also think in a different way, and I don't want to spend too long on this because you can spend all day talking about stone tombs, but they think in a different way about time. These people have put an investment into the landscape. They've altered the landscape. It's a totally different way of thinking from uh, Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. These people, although they might be 6,000 years ago, or nearly 6,000 years ago, are much, much, much closer to our way of thinking than people 500 years before them. Uh, much, much closer because they think of time in a linear way. They think of investment in the landscape. They think of passing things on, essentially. And the, the, if, if they maybe don't literally think of ownership of the landscape, they probably think of the rights to use the landscape. And that's at least partly what stone tombs are about. Uh, the, the, putting your, your, your mark, uh, what we have, we hold kind of idea on the landscape with these symbols of permanence into which you, you have the, the collected remains of, of the ancestors. Some of these tombs, if you look at the ones at the bottom there, that's the Loch, Loch Crew, which aligns on the, on the, not the, on the cross quarter days, the equinoxes, the two equinoxes that are aligns on the sunrise. Uh, if you can't get into Newgrange, you don't need to. Go to Loch Crew instead. There's no queue for Loch Crew. There's never more than a few dozen people there. If you go there at the two equinoxes on a sunny morning, it's magnificent. Uh, the light enters the tomb and goes straight to the carvings at the back, but that's nothing to do with Bronze Age uh, burials and society, but <clears throat> worth a visit. But uh, some people think that these big passage tombs show the emergence of an elite. It's hard to know. They may do. Uh, I think we need more information. Uh, and more studies, but uh, there's been some controversy, you're probably aware of the DNA results uh, from Newgrange and what all that means, and other passage terms, and what all that means, but that's a, a topic for a discussion on itself. So, uh, leaving the Neolithic, just about to hit the Bronze Age, or the overture to the Bronze Age, uh, in the very late Neolithic, there is change in the air. <clears throat> the passage terms seem to be being used a bit less uh, there are new large ritual structures like the giant ring in the top corner of the slide there. Uh, sometimes these are described as henges. They certainly bear a relationship to the henge monuments of Britain. They're similar in many respects. Uh, there are also uh, new ritual uh, timber circles and things like that. Uh, new, 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 new artifact types which show, seem to suggest continual interaction at this time between Ireland and Western Britain. Uh, there's a new type of stone tomb appears just on the cusp of the beginning of, of, of the Copper Age and the end of the Neolithic. Uh, the Chalcolithic, the Copper Age, as archaeologists sometimes split the early Bronze Age up into a bit of copper using and then a bit of proper bronze using. But uh, right at the cusp of the Neolithic of the Copper Age, there's this new type of tomb uh, called a wedge tomb. After five or six hundred years of new tombs really haven't been built, all of a sudden there's some three or four hundred years at least, there's a new tomb type uh, appear. So that's that's interesting. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Environmental evidence is not unanimous in what it says, but there are definite indications that the landscape is being exploited less intensively in the later part the last few centuries of the Neolithic than it had been during the Neolithic's halcyon days of the construction of the Neolithic farmsteads and most of the stone tombs. Uh, and that may well be uh, something that feeds into what happens later in the early Bronze Age. So moving into the, 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 the earliest bit of the Bronze Age, which uh, archaeologists sometimes call the Chalcolithic or the Copper Age, uh, bronze is, of course, an alloy of uh, copper and tin. Uh, it's a sort of a movable feast in archaeology as to when actual bronze production starts. Some people think that bronze is being produced from 
not very long after at all that the first copper working and other people suggest there was a gap of a few centuries. Uh, dating uh, tools is difficult unless they're found in association with other things that are, have known dates or alternatively with materials that can be radiocarbon dated. So dating of, of, of stone tools is always a, a, bit, of, a bit of a fun <laughs> deal. But something very important happens around 2500 BC thereabouts. Uh, and that very important thing is the appearance of uh, a copper mine uh, at Ross Island uh, in County Kerry. Uh, and uh, Ross Island is uh, an amazing place. Uh, it was excavated by Professor Billy O'Brien of, uh, of University College Cork back in the 1990s. And he found this copper mine. Uh, he also found traces of, uh, quite a lot of traces actually, of the, the miners' huts and also some of the, the, the basic processing of ore in the vicinity of the mine. Uh, he found a beaker pottery uh, uh, and got radiocarbon dates of between 24 and 2500 BC from the, uh, and later, 2400 BC and later, from the, uh, the, 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 the mine workings and the settlement. And, uh, uh, what's really, really interesting about Ross Island is that there's been chemical analysis now done on a lot of uh, copper and bronze objects from museums and excavations around Britain and Ireland. Pretty much all Irish copper comes from this one mine of that era. Uh, and what's really interesting is, well, pretty much all of British copper, certainly at least 70% of British copper uh, comes from this one mine as well. So this one mine is the actual linchpin of the British and Irish early Bronze Age uh, and Copper Age. Uh, uh, it's in use for Billy O'Brien reckon five, maybe 600 years. He thinks that production starts to decline around about 2000 BC with the mine being completely out of use before 1900 BC. So whether it went out of use in a single day or whether it gradually dwindled over a period of time, uh, but certainly it's out of use by 1900 BC and it's peak copper, if you like, has passed at 2000 BC. Uh, new slide. Uh, <clears throat> with this uh, new uh, metal using society, there are there there, there were other uh, rapid changes. I mentioned wedge tombs a minute ago, and I'm going to come back to wedge tombs in a wee while. But uh, uh, wedge tombs may well be related to the uh, the, the initial uh, copper workers. Uh, these copper workers were almost certainly immigrants. Uh, we know that because the copper working techniques which they bring are fully formed. Uh, they're not as if someone was learning on the job. It's as if expert copper workers started day one at Ross Island. But I'll address that in a little bit of time. But about 2200 BC, so a couple of hundred years into the Copper Age, uh, we get a new and completely unique, for Irish standards anyway, uh, burial uh, type uh, appear in the Irish landscape. Uh, and these are the, what's, what's sometimes described as the beginning of the single burial tradition. Uh, because most of these burials, not all, but most of these burials are burials of a single individual. Actually, in a lot of cases, there are two or three individuals, small family groups, but they're very distinct from the communal burial that uh, was, was most common in Ireland prior to that point, the communal burial in megalithic tombs, where you typically get uh, multiple different remains placed into essentially the same uh, burial chamber, uh, sometimes dozens, hundreds possibly even of remains in the same burial chamber. With the single burial tradition, in about half of graves, there's a single individual, and in the other half of graves, there are two or three, four, maybe individuals. There are very, very few which have been found with more than that. And typically where they are, it's a, a group of small children or a husband and wife and a family or something like that, one would suspect uh, from, the, uh, from, from the, the demographics of those graves. Of course, you can never be certain they could be mixed from different families, but uh, mostly it's, it's one individual or a very small group of, of individuals. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, a classic a kissed burial. This is the, 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 the very first uh, type of uh, early Bronze Age uh, single burial tradition burial in Ireland. Uh, this is one from County Dublin, Glass the Muggy. And uh, you can see the crouched inhumation, uh, inhumation burial that was on burnt remains. You can see the legs pulled tightly up towards the chest. You can just about here see, I'm circling it with the mouse, uh, a funerary vessel placed with the remains. 
and the grave itself is built from four large slabs of stone. Uh, in many occasions, the base of the, uh, the, the, the grave is also flagged or cobbled or similarly treated in some way to make uh, a floor. And these graves are invariably covered by a large, heavy capstone. Uh, which covers the grave. Uh, the burials which are found inside these graves, or sorry, the burials, the uh, funerary vessels which are found inside these graves uh, are similar to the one on the, the left here. This is uh, that glass, the front glass of the monkey. Uh, this is uh, a bowl, uh, uh, it was sometimes called a bowl food vessel or a bowl funerary vessel. Uh, the names are fairly arbitrary and have uh, grown up for historical reasons. They're not necessarily uh, uh, the names we would choose nowadays and we were starting from scratch to, to name all these things, but uh, it, it is sort of bowl sized and bowl shaped. You can see that a lot of these vessels are beautifully decorated. Uh, chevron designs are very common. Herringbone designs are very common. On this one, uh, it seems that the designs are made with, I think, cord impression. Uh, you get cord impressions, you get size lines, you get comb impressions too, where some sort of a bone comb or similar has been used to make uh, the impressions. And sometimes uh, the uh, sort of uh, bits of the bowls are, are, are pinched up to make sort of a relief uh, decoration as well. And sometimes bits are impressed actually to give a false relief if you like. Uh, so press bits down to raise up bits in the middle type of thing. Uh, so these are uh, invariably at the, at the start of the early bronze these are invariably intubations. They're invariably crouched they are typically, almost always at the start of the early Bronze Age, in a stone box called a cyst or kist. And uh, they're always accompanied by a funerary vessel. Other grave goods are not unknown, but they're rare at this early period, at the very start of the Bronze Age. Uh, so the Calcolithic start of the Bronze Age. Uh, Within a very short space of time of these burials uh, appearing, there are a couple of small uh, adaptations or uh, relatively small adaptations to the, the, the funerary ritual. Uh, the, the, there is a slightly new variant of funerary vessel, which is called the vase. Uh, again, so not necessarily the, the most informative of names, but these vase funerary vessels, the, the two at the bottom of this page, F and G, are vase funerary vessels of a sort of an extended neck. And you can see how they contrast with the, the bowl uh, funerary vessels uh, in the five examples above. There's a difference in form. Uh, there are, to some extent, differences in decorative uh, styles, but they do tend to follow the same chevron, herringbone uh, sort of set of motifs uh, in broad sense. Uh, one of the things about this set of burial practices in the early Bronze Age is that it tends to be additive uh, whenever new burial rituals come along, they tend to join the old burial rituals. The, 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 the new burial rituals do not tend to displace, at least not immediately anyway, the older traditions. So through the era, the amount of variety in funerary practice rises very considerably. Um, one of the most profound changes that happens in the Irish Early Bronze Age burial record is that around about 2050 BC, so 100, 150 years into the single burial tradition, uh, cremation appears in the burial record. Uh, cremation is a profound change, as you can imagine. I'll discuss it more in a little minute because in the next slide, because it really does need to be teased out a little bit. As well, from about 2050 onwards, uh, funerary vessels are no longer de rigueur. Not every uh, burial is buried with a funerary vessel from about 2050 onwards. They're an option. And uh, they are statistically more likely, significantly statistically more likely to be placed with the burials of males after 2050 than the burials of females. That does not mean that every man has a pot after 2050 or that every woman is without a pot. But statistically, there is an over a statistically significant overrepresentation of funerary vessels after 2050 in the in the burials of men, and a statistically significant underrepresentation in the burials of women. Where previously, up until this point, all burials, male or female, were buried uh, with uh, a pot. Uh, a lot of these. Uh, 
practices, uh, if you go back to books from 20, 30 years ago, a lot of these practices uh, uh, were sort of all seen as one big amorphous mass of early Bronze Age ritual. Uh, and it's really only been in recent years, partly because of uh, Bayesian radiocarbon analysis, Chris Bronk Ramsey's wonderful uh, OxCal calibration and sequencing tool, and also Paula Reimer and her team at Queen's in the radiocarbon lab, who have uh, produced over the past 30 years now the most amazing radiocarbon calibration curves, which have really taken radiocarbon from being, uh, you know, a fairly good guess to a really precise uh, uh, measure of, of chronological sort of change in the past. Uh, so those two things have really come together in the past few years to, to tease out uh, a lot of these strands. I've done a lot of it. There's, a, there's quite a lot of my uh, PhD work uh, involved uh, teasing out these strands of early Bronze Age uh, burial practice. Uh, I, I said I would mention cremation. Uh, cremation is a, is, is a fundamental change in burial ritual. It's a, it's a very important marker. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> you have to ask the question, why a burial ritual uh, changed so fundamentally uh, around this time? Uh, over, over, over the few decades after 2050, cremation doesn't just become an option. It starts off as an option in the Irish uh, Early Bronze Age burial record, but it, it turns into the dominant practice. And uh, this needs an, an awful lot of resources, really. Uh, modern Hindu burials take about 600 kilograms of wood to cremate a person. It, the bodies, human bodies are mostly water and uh, they, they don't burn particularly well. You need to add a lot of fuel to keep them lit and to carry out the cremation efficiently properly. Uh, and uh, osteoarchaeologists who have examined uh, Irish cremated remains from this area are fairly unanimous that almost all the burials are very well cremated. So they're certainly using 600 kilograms of wood or something in that region per, per, per set of human remains uh, to, 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 to burn them. So why is, is, is there so much effort being expanded and expounded on, on something that could just be done by, by putting an incubation into a kist. I think the, uh, the, the answer probably comes down uh, to uh, concepts of death in pre-modern societies. I'm always minded of that bit, you know, when, in The Princess Bride, uh, where they the, the bring the guy in who's accidentally, you know, sort of taken the, the poison tablet or whatever it is, and, and, and the wizard says he's mostly dead. Uh, not entirely dead. And that actually sums up to a certain extent how a lot of pre-modern people think about death. Today, in the modern world, we think of death as happening at a, a very a fixed time. It's on a, or a death certificate. It's, it's you know, considered the time that, that the heart stops or brain activity stops. But in pre-modern societies, when you stop being quick, if you like, when you start uh, not moving, uh, it's actually perceived as the beginning of a process of death, that death isn't really complete until the bones and the flesh are completely separated. <clears throat> and in that intervening period, before the complete separation of the bones and the flesh, there are all sorts of dangers for the family and for society. Uh, the spirit of the, the, the deceased, the dead, who is passing on, in the process of passing on to the other world, so to speak, has to be entertained, has to be placated with entertainments and rituals. If they don't, they may become they may become angry, they may bring bad luck on the family, they may haunt you. And of course, then there's the aspects of, of actual potential pollution of, of, of dead bodies. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why primitive people are afraid of the dead after they stop moving and before they become desiccated dry uh, bones. One way of speeding this up, of course, is, uh, is, is, is cremation. And it may be that cremation stops being uh, an option, or, well, sorry, cremation starts being an, an option in burial ritual around about 2050 BC, but very quickly becomes what most, almost all burials are being cremated within a few decades. And it probably is because it gets around that terrible problem of fear of pollution. In the era prior to cremation becoming Duragar, it is observed that <clears throat> most early Bronze Age burials are carried out into very, very, very dry ground, uh, typically very dry gravels, very dry sands. And that may be because there is a fear of, uh, of, of, of water logging causing a body not 
to, to decay at all or to decay very slowly or not maybe a, a, a something that uh, uh, that early Bronze Age people were, were very frightened of. Uh, Sorensen and Rebe have a great quote, which, which is really uh, informative when you think about it, which is the, the quote is that the understanding of what is a grave lags behind what is a body. And initially, the first uh, cremations around 2050 or thereabouts, they, they, they cremate the body, but they put it into a pit or a kist that looks just like the pit or a kist you would use for an incubation. And a bit like in that uh, photograph I showed you a couple of slides ago, I'm gonna go back to it very quickly. You have this lovely big kist, and you have a little little pile of almost lonely cremated bones and a pot beside them. It just doesn't look right. Sometime, not long after the first cremations, somebody had the fairly smart idea of, excuse me, inserting uh, the cremated remains into a vase and, uh, and inverting the vase and putting it into the burial. Much tidier job much more respectful, keeps the cremated remains nice and tightly together, that type of thing. Uh, and uh, within a fairly short period of time after that, uh, these little vases had become expanded into big vases, which was essentially the beginning of the burial urn tradition in Ireland. Uh, there is a little bit of debate amongst archaeologists about where this idea of cremation and insertion into an urn comes from. If you go back to the late Neolithic, there are a few burials which have been found where cremated remains are set into ware pots and similar and inverted and put into graves. There are a few. Uh, and there is always the possibility that while archaeologists may not have detected it, this tradition may have continued on uh, in a sort of residual state, an occasional practice, and somehow becomes reintegrated uh, into a uh, Bronze Age burial at a later stage. That is possible. Or alternately, it may just be uh, a, a, a new innovation, a new innovation, an innovation uh, of, 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 a, of something of, of the years after 2050 uh, BC. Uh, there are a couple of broad urn traditions in Ireland. Uh, there is uh, the vase and encrusted urn tradition. This is a, a, a vase urn, uh, A, in, in, in the top right there, uh, about 30 centimetres high, uh, much bigger than a typical vase, which would only be about 18 or 20 centimetres high. Uh, and then below it, there's the related uh, cordoned, or sorry, encrusted urn and these are large urns which have uh, uh, applied strips and applied lumps really of clay uh, to make sort of a, a relief decoration around the vessels some of them are, are very 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 heavily decorated this one the example i've just shown you actually there is, is quite lightly decorated by encrusted urn standards <coughs> excuse me and this is just a sort of little graphic showing that sort of process of the initial vase urns uh, on the left, then the enlarged vase urns being placed into a, a new uh, polygonal kist, a kist which is no longer a big rectangular kist, but, but which fits the, the shape of the urn. And then uh, the, the, the third stage of uh, uh, Irish urn development, if you like, the encrusted urn, or the third stage of this tradition anyway, the encrusted urn, which uh, is also enclosed in a little polygonal a stone yeah. box, a little polygonal uh, kist. Yes. Uh, uh, and on, the, on the left here, uh, a picture of uh, oh. uh, 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 an encrusted urn yes. under excavation. You oh, can see. Yes. oh, yes, sorry. Could, could oh, I right. just suggest that people uh, mute themselves? Oh, is there? Yes, is that what that is? Yes, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Low Dagman, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, this, is, this is an encrusted urn. You can probably see the, 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 the encrusted decoration, the applied decoration at the base of it during excavation. And you can see it's placed into a simple little pit. Uh, on the right, two examples of the other broad uh, urn tradition, the collared and the cordoned urn tradition. Uh, and uh, all these traditions, they, 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 have their, they, they don't all appear at the same time. They all appear over a, a couple of centuries, but it's likely that their usage is all overlap. Uh, and that they're all, at least for a period of time, in uh, contemporary use. <clears throat> in all, I, I mentioned that in the, uh, the early uh, two phases of uh, 
uh, early Bronze Age burial, which I'm going to in a minute or two start referring to as phase A, B and C in classic archaeological fashion. Uh, there are not many grave goods uh, used uh, in, or, or, or placed with the, the remains. In the, 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 the urn phase, if you like, the cremation and inverted urn phase of burial, uh, there is a lot more, there are a lot more uh, grave goods found uh, in, 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 the, in, in the urns with the cremated remains. Uh, these take many different forms. There are quite a lot of burials which have copper objects or bronze objects with them, bronze knives, bronze pins, bronze awls, possibly for working leather, uh, and in a few very interesting cases, uh, bronze daggers. Sometimes the daggers show a sort of an international uh, sort of aspect to them, which we'll discuss uh, in, in a moment or two. Uh, there are also a range of other objects, uh, flint knives, uh, scrapers, uh, bone objects, quite a lot of bone dress pins, some beautifully figured. Uh, and in the, in the middle example here, the, which is an encrusted urn, which has a uh, uh, fine C there, seems to be part of a bone whistle. And one of the things that actually came out from statistical analysis of the, uh, uh, I, I brought uh, several hundred of these uh, burials together into a, a, a database and then used a package called uh, SPSS to statistically analyze uh, the, the, the grave goods and other attributes of the burials together. Uh, one of the interesting things is that all of the burials which have these bone whistles in them all contain ch children's burials. So it does look likely that it's some sort of uh, a child's toy or something which is associated uh, with children, uh, these bone whistles. Uh, <clears throat> location is important uh, with uh, early, early Bronze Age burial. Uh, there are burials in what you might call, what archaeologists sometimes call flat cemeteries. Uh, it's always a, a bit of a question when, you, when, when a farmer or something finds a, a single kist or a single pit burial while plowing in a field. Is that pit burial really on its own? Is it really a single burial without any others around it? Or are, are the other burials in an area where the plow just didn't go so deep or they're under the hedge or something like that, you know? Uh, it's tempting to think really of two main categories of burial. Flat burials, which is where the, 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 the kist or pit has been placed uh, in a, a, a field, simply, in a, in a cemetery on, on, on flat, a flat, flat location. Uh, and then there are burials which are uh, inserted into mounds, uh, both purpose-built early Bronze Age burial mounds and reused uh, Neolithic uh, cairns uh, as well. Uh, again, statistical analysis has shown a lot of really interesting things about these. Uh, burials are much, much more common on the east side of these mounds and cairns, whether purpose-built or repurposed Neolithic cairns, <coughs> than they are on any other than, than they are on the west side. That's a statistically significant correlation at more than 95% probability. And in fact, you just have to. Be honest you just have to start looking at a few examples and all of a sudden it jumps out of the page that the burials are not all but mostly concentrated on the east side this is almost certainly some sort of a rising sun symbolism there are also uh almost statistically significant correlations just below the level of statistical significance of uh of, of bodies being positioned in the ground where their incubations obviously you can't do this with cremations but where their incubations positioned in such a way that they face towards the east. Not necessarily their heads pointing or their, their bodies pointing towards the east, but their face pointing towards the east. But that's just below the level of statistical significance, unfortunately, probably because of the relatively small number of incubations compared to the number of, of cremations, which have no orientation. <coughs> Another really interesting thing is that there appears to be an overrepresentation of females in the center and central parts of these burial mounds and an overrepresentation of men in the outer parts of these burial mounds. Uh, obviously concepts of, again, of uh, rebirth and, 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 and reincarnation and fertility may be encoded in that. Uh, this uh, overrepresentation is, is below the 95% level of statistical significance, but it's below, it's, it's above the one sigma. So it's, uh, it's, it's an excess of 60, 66% likelihood of this being a real correlation. I suspect that it is a real correlation, but I can't obviously put my hand on my heart. Uh, but uh, I, it's, it's the relatively small number of 
uh, cases, which, especially with cremations, where you can make a definitive statement about the gender, the sex of the cremated individual, unfortunately, uh, is skewing the data a little bit there. It's putting in a lot of indeterminate cases, which is, is making it harder to come up to a level of statistical significance. So that still has to have a big question mark beside it, but it looks likely. And another important correlation, and this is a statistically significant one, is that burials in mounds have statistically significantly less multiple burials. So I think what we're seeing here is a, a kind of a status association, especially uh, in certain periods of the early Bronze Age, between slightly special people being placed into burial mounds with uh, 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 the, uh, on, on their own as opposed to being placed in flat cemeteries with multiple people in the one grave. The assumption being that if you're placing someone and making all that effort, all that energy, if you like, work going into being a single grave and putting one person into it, then that person is worthy of the extra special treatment than if you, than if you use that grave multiple different times for multiple different uh, people. Uh, the latest that I'm going to talk about this great phase A, B and C uh, uh, again in a minute, but the, the, the latest phase C burials, basically the urn burials as a whole, are less likely to be found in mounds and cairns, but the richest, the clearly most opulent phase C burials, the ones with the copper objects and the daggers and the very fine bone dress pins, are more likely to be found in burial mounds, either repurposed Neolithic cairns or uh, uh, purpose-built early Bronze Age uh, burial mounds. And the, 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 the example par excellence uh, are the large number of uh, uh, early Bronze Age, mostly urn uh, burials in the, the Mound of the Hostages at Tara. It's quite clear that as early as 2000 BC or a little afterwards, uh, people were realizing that Tara was 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 super special and were reappropriating it. A new a new uh, dynasty, if you like, was reappropriating it uh, for their their own for their own ends. Uh, <clears throat> three phases of early Bronze Age ritual. I've sort of mentioned them in passing. I'll formalize them up now. Uh, that I've been able to identify anyway by looking at uh, uh, burial practice in conjunction with radiocarbon dates. Phase A. So 2200 to 2050, kists and pit burials, uh, bowls or vases in every single grave, uh, other grave goods only occasional and optional, uh, exclusively incubation, uh, little distinction in the treatment of men and women, and children, uh, children buried, yes, but typically only in burials with adults, not typically buried on their own. In phase B, which is the second phase, starting in about 2050 and, and extending for about a century. Uh, cremation in kists uh, and in pits uh, is now becoming the order of the day. Cremation is gradually replacing, or quite rapidly replacing it, most incubations. Uh, pottery is now optional. You can choose to have a pot in the, or choose to place a pot in the, uh, in, 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 in the grave or not. Uh, women, as I mentioned, less likely to have an accompanying pot. Grave goods are still optional, but are becoming slightly more common. And it's during this period that we start to see the first cremations in a vase. Uh, phase C is the, 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 the period of proper urn burials. Uh, urn burial is now the most common burial form. By the way, I, I mentioned this most common, and I, I mentioned this at the start. This tradition is additive. The, the, the really, most of the traditions continue in, in a reduced frequency the whole way through this period. We have inhumations, although in, in, cremation becomes 95% of all burials, there are still inhumation burials right through phase B and right through to phase C. There may be a, a little time, maybe between 1700 and 1800 BC, where inhumations die out, but they get going again in the 1600s. There are a small number of them, even one or two, two actually, in, in, in the Mount of the Hostages of Tara. So they still, they still these, these earlier uh, uh, burial traditions still all continue on through, through, through the three phases of the early Bronze Age uh, burial ritual. There are just new traditions added and new traditions become uh, fashionable. So uh, <coughs> in this phase C, <coughs> excuse me, Grave goods do become much more common and they become more opulent, especially in the cordoned urns, but also in all the other types of urns as well. Uh, and uh, men and women and children are equally re represented in, 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 phase, in most phase C burials and, and the urns, 
but apart from uh, the opulent burials in the cordon urns, which are overwhelmingly adult males, in fact, there are no children at all, uh, and only a couple of women in the uh, 25 or 30 uh, cordon urns, which have really opulent uh, burial uh, goods uh, with them. And in fact, I'm suspicious that the one or two examples of female burials may be uh, wrongly sexed because they seem so incongruous with the with the other 28 or thereabouts, 25 or 28 uh, uh, burials. Uh, just on the left here, I'm not going to spend any time on it, it's just a, a radiocarbon plot. Uh, it actually doesn't make a lot of sense without the contextual uh, information with it. Uh, there are there are different bands here depending on uh, different calculations of the beginnings and ends of phases. The light grey bands being uh, possible but unlikely. The dark the darker grey bands being probable, and the black areas being the overlap of the the two distributions of you know, begins and ends. So it, without the accompanying text, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Apart from it shows that really the single burial tradition is starting shortly after or around 2200 BC and continuing to about or almost 1600 BC. The reason why some of the other ranges look longer and seem to extend to 1300 or 1400 BC is really a statistical artifact. Uh, as you would imagine, uh, whenever you go to estimate the, 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 the span of, of, of a period of time, if you have three radiocarbon dates, say, or four radiocarbon dates, well, can you be sure that they're evenly spread along the exact length of the period of use of this artifact type or this ritual practice? They could all be bunched at one end or the other or bunched in the middle. So whenever you, uh, if you have 30 or 40 dates, of course, you'll be much more confident that they'll be evenly spread uh, along the, the actual period of use of this artifact or this ritual practice. And when you use uh, statistical methods to estimate uh, radiocarbon phase durations, phases of, of different types of activity, if you've only a few dates, uh, the statistical algorithms will artificially extend the, the, the beginnings and ends sometimes to the extent where they're, they're not, it's, it's not worth doing the, the, the statistical calculation in the first place. You already know from other archaeological information that it's a tighter date range than that. So um, I want to talk a little bit now, that's, that's, that's a basic introduction to the types of burial practice. I want to look now a little bit at ways of looking at burial complexity, sort of getting back to the ideas of Lewis Binford and Tainter and Peebles and Cuss to sort of see if we can sort of say through the early Bronze Age, phases A, B and C, what types of societies we are, we are dealing with. The first thing I did was look at what, what I called burial attribute contributions. This is really pretty simple, really. I just looked at how many choices there were available in the burials for each of the main phases. Primary choices, if you like. <clears throat> when there are only one in 20, phase uh, A burials contain a uh, a, 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 a very uh, unimpressive uh, artifact, like a piece of struck flint or something put into it. I didn't really consider that to be a burial choice. I was talking about choices which are clear and definitive and turn up in most graves. So for phase A, I, I was able to identify three main choices available to mourners when deciding how to treat the remains of their loved one. The choice of interring the remains either in an individual or a multiple grave. In other words, are we going to put granddad in with Uncle Joey or are we going to lavish a grave of his own on him? That sort of choice. Uh, the second is the choice whether to put uh, to, 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 to dig and construct a kist or whether a more simple pit grave. Again, there's a, there's, there's a work difference there. If you dig a simple oval pit that's human body shaped, it takes a good bit less effort than to go and select and drag some very large flags and capstone and paving stone and, make, and construct a, a kist. And also the choice of burial location. I think we've, we've uh, well, I was able to establish that uh, there is a linkage between the placement in a cairn or burial mound and other things that might be associated with status, like say individual burial uh, and, and other attributes as well through the whole of the early Bronze Age. So the presence, uh, the location of the burial within a cairn or a cemetery mound or alternatively in an unmarked uh, place in, 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 in uh, 
of that cemetery. That's another burial choice. So in phase A, there are three different burial choices. And of course, that gives you nine different ways to combine those three different burial choices. Nine possible ways in which you can mark, uh, using the main burial rituals anyway, uh, your ancestor, or the, your deceased or relative. Um, for phase B, there are a, clearly a, a number of additional attributes uh, have been added to the, uh, the, 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 the menu for, 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 for burial practice, for burial ritual. We've still got the choice whether to uh, inter the remains individually as a multiple burial, uh, but we now have an additional choice. We have the choice, at least for phase B, this choice almost dies out in phase C, but uh, a choice between an incubation and cremation. Cremation, of course, takes quite a bit more uh, effort uh, than incubation. It takes cutting down a number of trees, uh, chopping them up, building a pyre, uh, that sort of thing. The choice whether to place a kist or a pist, uh, <laughs> a pit or a kist. Uh, the decision whether or not to include a pottery vessel in the grave, because of course, up, up until this point, uh, all graves have pottery vessels, but from, from 2050 onwards, it's a, an option for, 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 for uh, phase B burials. And then again, the choice of burial location. So we have five different choices, five different binary choices. Now, does anyone who knows their, their binary as opposed to base 10, that works out at the number 32. Uh, 32 possible combinations of actual ritual uh for for this period ritual attributes can be combined in 32 different ways with five choices so you have a lot more ways in which you can express yourself and you can express what's appropriate for the deceased of that 32 i think i found about 26 uh, in my database there are a few that i haven't found uh that may just be because of a number, a number of reasons they may just not have been found or sometimes especially when you're dealing with slightly older excavations the standard of recording maybe isn't just as good as it is in later ones although for my database i tried to avoid most most of the uh, antiquarian and patchy accounts and stick to uh 20th century scientific excavations or ones where antiquarians were maybe late 19th century antiquarians were particularly advanced and in good drafts people and stuff like that brought in uh and uh but uh, I found about 26 out of the 32 uh, possible combinations of those burial attributes. <clears throat> In phase C, all bets are off. There are still the same five uh, uh, main choices, but the difference is, is that we now have grave goods. And I'm going to talk in the next slide about ways of codifying different types of grave goods according to their status and using some of the ideas of tender of energy expenditure and work input. Uh, because it's quite clear that a struck flint flake is not categorically the same as a beautiful bronze dagger of Breton style with a, with a, an amber pommel and, and, and a gold, golden rivets or something like that placed into it, or, or hammered golden, uh, I can't remember what you call them, not rivets, but decorative uh, little pieces. It's not the same categorically at all. So you have to look at, you have to score that in some way as a, as a different choice. But, uh, and I'll discuss that in a minute, but allowing for four different grave choices from no grave good addition uh, at, at all, which is zero, to one, two, or three, if you like, of a score for uh, uh, different uh, grave good statuses, if you like, that gives about 64 possible combinations of actual ritual during the urn burial uh, phase of, of, of phase C. I mentioned grave good status very, very quickly. Uh, zero for no grave good added to the grave. Uh, and I only do this for phase C because, of course, in phase A and B, there are practically no graves which have grave goods added. They're exceptional uh, and stick out as outliers in the rest of, of, of the set. But in, grave, uh, in phase C, grave goods are commonplace. So no grave good of any kind scores zero. An unimproved object of a commonplace raw material, so it's, it's one, scores one, that's like an unretouched flake, just a, a simple napped flake, uh, not retouched or, or finished in any way, uh, uh, scores one. A well-defined artifact, 
from a commonplace raw material is scores two. So that'll be something like a flint knife or a retouched good quality scraper. It needs a certain amount of investment of time and skill, but the raw material is probably every day, uh, not uh, something exceptional, but a nice a nice object, but not something that uh, is, 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 is something that particularly marks uh, a burial out as exceptional anyway. And then grave good category three, uh, which is either notable for the raw material and or the significant input of specialist craft. So uh, copper and bronze objects obviously come into that. Not only is the raw material have to come from a distance, uh, copper from Kerry, tin from Cornwall, it has to be taken and made by uh, a specialist uh, to turn it into some sort of useful object. So they would be marked out as, as special objects. And also any object which uh, such as complex jewellery. That could be made out of something relatively simple like bone, but some of the bone pins and things like that which have been made are exceptional objects and they uh, are, are, are clearly need many hours of, of work to, to turn out uh, high quality objects. They're something which is somewhat different from the category one and two uh, grave goods. So I've scored grave goods for phase C uh, using this uh, manner. So just looking at the burial attribute combinations alone, it's clear that there, there, there is an increase in complexity of burial ritual. There are more, are more choices uh, uh, available for the, uh, the, the deceased to be, the, their, 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 their social persona, if you like, uh, to be recognized in burial ritual. Uh, however, <clears throat> that could suggest that the tribes are becoming increasingly large and complex with more sodalities, more sorts of uh, attributes for different age sets, more attributes for different clubs. Essentially, that's the sort of what sodality kind of means. It's an anthropologist's word for clubs, like uh, medicine clubs and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, different, different, different hunting clubs and things like that. Uh, it, could, it could reflect simply people's profession with you know, spe craft specialism within the tribe. Is there any evidence for an actual establishment of a chieftain for an elite uh, which uh, has a uh, uh, is differentiated from the rest of the society uh, through lineage or something similar. And to do that, uh, I, I, I started a cluster analysis of uh, each of the three different phases. Cluster analysis is a, a statistical technique, uh, usually computerized, though you can do it manually if you've got a year or two to hang around. Uh, and it, it, it really helps you see the wood from the trees. What it does is it takes cases and it scores how alike the different cases are. You give it a series of clustering attributes and it will score how similar the attributes in case one, case two, case three are to each other and then clump different groups together. And you should hopefully, if you've set up your uh, uh, clustering uh, routine with the right clustering attributes, you should hopefully get uh, a set of clusters which have some real connection, some validity in the real world, which express or show you something about what's really happening, uh, which you otherwise wouldn't be able to uh, easily grasp just by looking at the data as a whole. <laughs> and uh, I used for each of the three phases the the, the burial cluster attribute, sorry, burial uh, attributes that uh, I, I, I've been discussing up to now. So, as for instance, whether burials in a kist or a pit, in an, in, in an individual or a multiple burial, whether it's in a cairn or a flat cemetery, that type of thing for each of the, the three uh, phases. Uh, also, uh, once the clustering routine was finished, I uh, attributed a status value uh, to each cluster based on the energy input of each variable. So KIST needs more energy input than a PIT, so it scores one as opposed to zero. Individual, uh, multiple, one, zero. Uh, if, as is the case in a number of clusters where you get a mix, so for instance, cluster four there in phase A below, you'll see that uh, it says individual, multiple, both. Well, what you do there is if you've got 10 cases, as you had in this, and there are seven who are individuals and three who are non-individuals, you'll give a code score of 0.7 to calculating your, your status. So uh, cluster number four were all kists, so that's a one there. 
all cairns, that's a one there, and not 0.7 for individual and multiple, because there were seven individuals and three multiple burials. So you get a status value of 2.7 for the cluster. Also, each cluster member is, giving, is given an index value, and that means that it's possible to take that cluster and cross-reference those, or cross-tabulate those, uh, those individual cluster members against other burial attributes, allowing you to see if cluster four, and you can see in this case, uh, has an over-representation of older children. You see ages, over-representation of older children. Uh, but the one plus there, uh, two pluses indicate statistically significant that two sigma or 95%. One plus suggests an over-representation, but it isn't coming up to the two sigma. It's above one sigma, but not coming up to the two sigma, 95% of statistical significance. Sorry if I'm being a wee bit technical. I'm happy to answer questions about this at the end. The, the, this, this table of phase A clusters, uh, phase A was split into four clusters and you can see the range of statuses. It's quite interesting that the two highest status clusters are both older children. In the case, uh, well, at least have an over-representation of older children, although below statistical significance. It's also interesting <coughs> that uh, cluster four, the highest status cluster, has an under-representation of men, again, below statistical significance, and the second cluster has an over-representation of, uh, of, uh, of, of girls uh, below the, or uh, women, sorry, below statistical significance. The lowest cluster has an over-representation of males, which is statistically significant, that's the M++, and it has an, a, a non-statistically significant over-representation of older males and mature, or older adults and mature adults, OA and MA. So basically, this cluster analysis is telling us is that there are no clear distinctions caused by the age and sex uh, distinctions that we would expect in, in, in a society which was focused around uh, stratified hierarchies, if you like. What we are probably seeing with the slight over-representations of children in clusters four and one is an emotional uh, engagement uh, of lost, lost, well, lost potential of children, older children, but not just lost potential. It's quite possible that in early societies like this where infant mortality was very high, people were preconditioned to the idea that they might use, lose uh, infants, young children at an early age, but by the time they got them to seven or eight or nine years of age, they presumably had a great emotional attachment and hope they were going to uh, mature to adulthood. And you're probably seeing the expression of their emotional loss in these top two clusters. This is very typical of what you would expect in a society which was fairly egalitarian in its social structure. Has hierarchy, yes, but hierarchy based on personal attributes, not upon uh, ascribed states uh, from elsewhere. Uh, oh, well, I've just said all that, basically. Uh, uh, that's, that's the phase A cluster results and the top panel. Uh, the bottom panel is the phase B cluster results. Again, the five uh, clustering attributes are the ones that we have for uh, the, 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 the burial attributes for phase B. Uh, interestingly, despite the fact that uh, uh, I, I mentioned earlier about there being uh, uh, a, a clear uh, cor a correlation between uh, pot use and meals in phase B. The cluster analysis did not itself bring out any sexual differentiation, which means it's, it must mean it's just limited to that one aspect uh, of the burial. But uh, what is interesting is that the highest uh, status clusters have a significant over-representation of older people. Um, the second highest status cluster in this case has a significant uh, over-representation of adolescents, uh, with the fourth cluster having a significant over-representation, that's the two pluses, of, of adults. Uh, again, there doesn't seem to be any real indication here of, uh, of, 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 of ranking uh, of, uh, of, of a society in which status is ascribed or status comes from inheritance or family lineage or anything like that. I think that this suggests that phase B uh, is like phase A, it is a tribal society, uh, but what we're seeing with the burial attribute contributor combinations uh, and the greater amount of funerary complexity in phase B is the fact that it is a, a tribal society which has developed more complex inter-tribal institutions uh, and uh, has a more complex system of, uh, 
of, of, of sharing out uh, uh, work and, 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 and specialisms and, and, and similar. Uh, phase C cluster analysis. This cluster analysis is much more complex. <clears throat> and this is a lot more like what Peebles and Kosse mentioned at the start suggest that as their correlates, that horrible big word, uh, meaning things that you might associate with a chieftain. The first thing really sticking out in sore thumb, partly because I've coloured it lilac, uh, is uh, the top cluster. Uh, the top cluster, cluster six. Uh, and uh, this cluster uh, contains most of the high status grave goods uh, in the entire Irish early uh, Bronze Age uh, burial record. The bulk of them are all in that one cluster. The bulk of the daggers are all in that one cluster. And it's a cluster which is overwhelmingly composed of adult males. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two women in that cluster, but I'm a little bit suspicious that they might be uh, uh, wrongly sexed. Uh, although, although I couldn't be certain of that. Uh, there are no children. I know it says there C minus, which means an underrepresentation of children that isn't statistically significant. Uh, that's because uh, of the, uh, uh, the relatively small size of the cluster, I think relative to the entire data set. But there are no children in that cluster whatsoever. Uh, and it's also uh, associated with court and urns. All of the, the burials in this cluster are court and urns. So it's statistically overrepresented. Uh, there is in, also with this cluster a, a non-statistical overrepresentation of burials uh, within uh, within within current within currents, but it's not statistically significant. Uh, the second cluster in crusted urns have uh, have also got uh, uh, an overrepresentation of grave goods, grave goods one and two. Uh, with them, uh, but uh, they're, 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 uh, they have quite high status, but they, they, it's, they, they may well be part of the app, but what uh, Peoples and Cusk called the apical class too, although it's also possible that they're part uh, of a broad uh, middle class, if you like. Uh, I'm just going to go to the next slide where I lay this out a little bit uh, differently and also talk about, uh, well, I just copy really from a book, uh, some of the correlates uh, that uh, Peoples and Cusk suggest. Uh, we've already sort of talked about one, the more complex rituals uh, that achieved office societies. Achieved office societies really means tribes where you have institutions where people kind of roles as club members or, you know, so sometimes in, in, in Native American societies, what they call chief is actually something that you, 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 you get through uh, achieving certain uh, goals in life rather than because you're the son of a chief, for instance. So that sort of thing is what they mean there. Uh, significant differentiation between uh, status uh, of the different groups in the burial records, superordinate and subordinate. Uh, I think we can see that there are, there is certainly a big status span between the lowest and the highest groups uh, in, in this cluster analysis, and they fit together uh, quite coherently. There's also some evidence for a ranking pyramid, and there are two ways of doing this. You can either eyeball it as the sort of light, line, green line does on the left side of the cluster analysis between an apical group at the top and then a sort of superordinate group uh, and then uh, a subordinate group, or you can just do it more statistically in, in, the, in the chart at the bottom of blue, where uh, uh, I saw a quartile division uh, of the uh, of the of the different status groups uh, reveals a, a sort of ranking pyramid as well. And in fact, if you do that with a, a division into thirds, it's actually much more apparent that there's a, a big division between. Uh, the, 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 the three groups. But this one's nice because it, it just nicely, uh, uh, the, the, it nicely uh, hives off the apical group uh, at, at the top. Uh, and <clears throat> a correlation between prestige groups uh, and the other indicators of high status burial. We'll have discussed that cluster six, uh, the, 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 almost all the dagger burials in, in, in Ireland belong to that group. Uh, and also an apical class of small male opulent burials. But uh, I've said that's just small males. That, of course, means a small apical class of male opulent burials rather than, rather, rather than uh, small males. Uh, cluster 8 uh, doesn't quite fit. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an overrepresentation of children, and they're placed into cairns. Uh, and you can see that's a 
three axes. That means a statistically uh, significant at three sigma, which is 99% something. Uh, and these are <coughs> insertions <coughs> of uh, children's burials and a few adult burials as well into, in, into kerns uh, and uh, with no associated pot or urn. A lot of these are undated, and I actually suspect that a lot of these might be late Bronze Age. They've been assumed to be early Bronze Age because they're associated with other early Bronze Age burials, but I actually think this is a continuation of a different practice into the period beyond 1600, 1500 BC, into the middle or later Bronze Age. So they may not entirely fit the rest of the, uh, the data. And you can see in the lowest clusters here, uh, over-representation of young children, uh, cluster 11, uh, cluster 7, uh, uh, an over-representation of young children and older children. Uh, <clears throat> and also, these mainly tend to be potless burials uh, without urns. Potless burials used to be thought, before uh, radiocarbon analysis of these burials, uh, used to be thought to be just potless kists and potless pits, and to date to the early phase of the early Bronze Age, in other words, what we would now call phase A and B, uh, and that uh, in the later urn period, these burials weren't present. Uh, radiocarbon dating has actually shown that not to be the case, and that the tradition of burying in kists and in pits of cremations and cubations without accompanying pots, and typically without accompanying grave goods, the whole way through the early Bronze Age, which is something which was not recognised before. Very, very quick summary before I'm going to start to draw all this a little bit to an end because I suspect I'm going to run over time uh, very soon. Uh, but uh, but I don't mind going over if you don't mind, but you might mind. You might be falling asleep after all that. Uh, but most people sleep. But uh, <clears throat> we have a new burial, right? The single burial tradition around 2200 BC. And over the next few centuries, this tradition modifies and adapts and it takes on, it takes on new occupants and doesn't always cast them away. So, it, so effectively, we have an increasingly complex uh, set of burial uh, attributes, which should reflect an increasingly complex society. And certainly in phase A and B, we can see evidence for an increasingly complex chiefdom. And with things like that apical class and the broad division of the rest of the clusters uh, in phase C into two other broad groups of status, it looks like we've got evidence in phase C for the emergence of an established uh, aristocracy. What could have brought this about? Uh, what could have brought about, for a start, the beginning of the single barrel tradition? And what brought about the changes in the single barrel tradition as well? Uh, with regards to origins, I've mentioned Ross Island. Uh, and, this, uh, and the copper working there, which is probably the work of migrants. And I've also mentioned wedge tombs, which appear in Ireland about 2500 BC, roughly. There's been a big dating program. There's a couple of big dating programs carried out of these by uh, uh, Anna Brindley and Leanne Lanting and Rick Schulting and Eileen Murphy and others, two different programs. Uh, and they both come up with the same kind of answers. Wedge tombs appear around 2500 BC. And a number of people have, have, have noted that the wedge tombs are very reminiscent of the French Alley Couvert. I haven't got my accents on there. I can't figure out how to do it with this keyboard. Uh, the French Alley Couvert, at, at megalithic tombs. <coughs> and DNA evidence around this time, which some of you may be aware of, points to a major migration into Ireland uh, in the Calcolithic or the early Bronze Age. Uh, and that this uh, major migration brings people to Ireland with a big component of step DNA. In fact, the migration uh, studies, there, sorry, the, the DNA studies that have been done seem to indicate that there may be, at least in parts of the country, uh, at least on the Y, at least on the Y mail line, in certain parts of the country, near complete population replacement, which is very interesting. Uh, whether it's simply that they kill all the people or whether they just kill all the men, or don't allow the men to, 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 to procreate or something like that. Uh, but the, 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 the Y DNA of the, the previous Neolithic people in Ireland is not present after 2500 BC, or it's not present in any skeletons that, or many skeletons that have had their DNA tested up until this point. And that's really, really interesting. The middle photograph uh, looks really like an Irish single burial, tradition burial. But it isn't. Uh, it's actually a beaker barrel, uh, a classic uh, Central Northern European uh, beaker barrel. 
Uh, and uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the, 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 the top right hand image is of a beaker uh, from Scotland and uh, some arrowheads and a bracer for uh, an archer to wear on the wrist. And uh, that's the sort of classic sort of beaker that would be inserted in a, a, a beaker burial. It looks very like the Irish single burial tradition, but they're not entirely uh, the same. And it makes you wonder, uh, what is the actual connection between the Irish single burial tradition and, and beaker burials? They're not the same because, there are a lot of reasons why they're not the same, but there are subtle reasons. The vessels are different. The range of grave goods that are associated uh, with the vessels are different, much fewer in Irish context. And also there are subtle differences in orientations of bodies and things like that, which side they lie on left or right. Uh, in the Irish burials, it's less codified than in the bigger burials. So there are differences, but they're very, very strongly reminiscent. Uh, <clears throat> I have a theory about this. It's a little bit of, of kite flag, but it is based on uh, on, 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 on well-founded ideas. Uh, I've mentioned the strong migration evidence into Ireland during the Calcolithic. I probably should have a map with arrows here, but uh, the, the, the bigger tradition is a European tradition uh, which moves across Europe. And at some stage, the bigger tradition, probably about 2600 BC, splits into two streams. And one stream heads down at the Atlantic, Western Atlantic Europe, and the other stream heads along the Rhine, and both make their way into Ireland and Britain, basically. Uh, the, the maritime one comes up and under from below, quite possibly from Western France or Brittany or somewhere similar. And the, uh, the, 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 the northern stream of Beaker <coughs> makes its way into Britain. And uh, so we, we, we've sort of a pincer action of, 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 of uh, Beaker migration, sort of focusing on, on, on sort of north, Northwest Europe. Uh, so we do have, as I mentioned, solid evidence, I think, from the, the nature of the copper industry and possibly also from the wedge tubes to suggest an, an Atlantic uh, beaker uh, migration into Munster, possibly moving on the other bits of Ireland around 2500 uh, BC. But the really interesting thing that I mentioned, the really important thing that I mentioned earlier on is Ireland being the main source for British copper at this time. Uh, there is lots of evidence for Irish copper being traded into Scotland, th up through the Great Glen into the northeast of Scotland. This isn't just uh, the evidence of the copper itself, although the copper is there, it's been analysed uh, many times. Scottish uh, early Bronze Age copper has been shown to be overwhelmingly of Irish origin. Uh, but also the forms of much Scottish copper working, uh, the Migdale Marnock tradition, as it's sometimes called, uh, is very, very Irish in its execution. And uh, in addition, I mean, you just look at the northeast of Scotland, where there seems to be a huge concentration of this copper working. Uh, there's a, a stone circle tradition uh, in which the details of the stone circle almost match exactly the details of some Munster stone circles. And I'm talking about things like uh, in Munster stone circles, there tend to be two uh, stones flanking uh, a sort of a recumbent stone opposite the entrance, two large stones tall stones, flying a flat recumbent stone, like a table stone, uh, opposite the entrance to the stone circles. And in Scottish stone circles, you get the table stone opposite the entrance, but you get the two uh, uh, entrance stones, if you like, uh, the two tall the two stones, flanking, yeah, flanking the entrance. And that, that similarity is, uh, is, 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 is really interesting. Uh, although the dating doesn't necessarily match up perfectly, but there's been so little dating work done in these stone circles, they're so hard to date. So anyway, to cut a long story short, because we could talk about this for a long time, <clears throat> there is definitely a lot of Irish movement of, uh, of, of, of metal traders and quite possibly metal workers to and from Scotland during the early uh, Bronze Age period. And Scotland, of course, has a classic bigger tradition. And I think it's not unreasonable to suggest that uh, the single burial tradition is born on the large Strunnar Ferry, I suppose, effectively, uh, on the Irish sea border. Uh, it's, uh, it's born through the intercourse of trade and travel, uh, effectively, across uh, the North uh, Channel. The bigger that I showed in the last screen and the bigger that I showed on this screen is really interesting. It comes from a place called Caldoughal in Inverness, it's a classic beaker burial, uh, flat cemetery, pit, uh, beaker, crouched inhumation, 
Arrowheads racer and a little flint scraper. The isotopic analysis of the buried individual suggested that he was from Northeast Ireland. Uh, so he had been born and reared in Northeast Ireland, somewhere where you find absolutely no beaker burials. So he had gone to Scotland, possibly as a copper trader, or possibly just because there were migratory uh, routes opened up by the copper trade, possibly they had already been there from the Neolithic, and the copper trade was just taking advantage of them. But he is moving into Scotland and being buried in what would have been a Scottish style bigger burial in uh, around about 2200 BC from the radiocarbon dates from that burial. And at almost exactly that period of time, burials are starting to appear in Ireland, which are remarkably similar to bigger burials, but are somehow changed and adapted and put into an Irish context. Incidentally, not long after that, you start to see bowl burials of Irish type in Western Scotland too. <coughs> Excuse me. So there is some sort of a milieu happening, which is uh, uh, causing an, an, an effusion of, of, of cultural, of, 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 of new cultural styles. Uh, Stuart Needham, the English archaeologist, uh, comes up with this wonderful phrase. He talks about the fishing horizon in the British Early Bronze Age, when uh, the, the, the rigidity of classic beaker brack practice breaks down into a number of subtypes. And I see something similar uh, with, uh, with, 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 with uh, the Irish single burial tradition, but it's not a fission, it's a fusion uh, of, of two different uh, burial styles to make uh, a third, if you like, it's a new one, uh, which is reminiscent uh, of, of, of Irish and Scottish traditions, but particularly the Scottish ones. Uh, well, they're not Scottish traditions, they're European white traditions in both, both senses. At the other end, 1900 BC, we, with phase C, uh, I think there is evidence from the cluster analysis to suggest a genuine uh, emergence of some sort of elite. Uh, what could have caused that to happen? If you go back to your Marx, Gordon Child, and, 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 and all those people, Gordon Child would have suggested that really the, that the conditions were already there for a hierarchical, uh, well, a stratified hierarchical society to emerge from the very start of Bronze Age Ireland. You've got agriculture, you can have surplus, you've got raw materials, you've got copper workers. What are you waiting for? You know, get some get some kings and aristocrats going there. But of course, inertia is a great thing. And uh, things can stay the same for a very long time in human society until there's a crisis. And uh, where in the early Bronze Age period can you look for a crisis? There isn't much evidence for an environmental crisis during that period. Oh, there are a few blips on the way, but there's there's nothing, there's nothing uh, earth shattering environmentally like there are in some other periods where you see huge sort of collapses in pollen record or or, or, or evidence for, 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 for no tree growth for, for years and things like that. But uh, there's no evidence of any environmental. What there is uh, around sometime between 2000 and 1900 BC is there's the cessation of, uh, of copper production at Ross Island. And as I mentioned earlier, Ross Island is responsible for producing all of the Irish and the, the, the overwhelming majority of British copper in the early Bronze Age. Uh, this is a classic uh, supply crisis. Uh, and you think of the supply crises we've had in, in, you know, in, in, in our lifetime, so my lifetime anyway, uh, there's the, you know, the, 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 I remember the, uh, the, the oil crisis of 1973, and of course, that, that led to the, the IMF in 1976 and uh, the three day week and all that sort of thing. But, but it was just a, a constriction of supply it caused really a, an increase in price. And then you look at 2008 and the, uh, the, sort of the, 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 the uh, money supply crisis then. Imagine a, a, a supply crisis of something like oil where one day there's, there's plenty and the next day there's none. And imagine the effects that would have. It would cause collapse of banks and businesses, governments would fall, entire regimes would fall, states would collapse, would break up. Uh, there'd be a huge crisis. And I think that the, there is a copper crisis uh, sometime around or before, just before 1900 BC, a very serious copper crisis. Uh, and what would happen in such a scenario? The first thing that would happen is, is that the copper miners' importance is gone. Uh, uh, what what uh, Billy O'Brien 
not thinking, I think, uh, in, in a strict anthropological sense, but what he called the Lunulai chiefs <laughs> of Munster, the, the people who had grown rich through trading uh, through trading copper and were able to afford these lovely gold Lunulai, these gold collars, uh, or if, if they're actually worn like that, they may not be. But um, the people who had those lovely gold Lunulai, uh, if, if, their, if, if, if their wealth is, is, is completely gone instantly, and if the copper traders, the people who carry copper, uh, in, in on their backs or on, on, on little on, 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 on pack animals or whatever, up through the, the Shannon Basin, uh, across into South Wales or Cornwall, up into County Andrum and over into Scotland, if, if they're, they're, they're suddenly redundant. And the people who hold the economic power are actually now the copper smiths because they can recycle and reform and remake copper. And copper is now going to become from being, well, I don't think it was ever uh, uh, something you would casually dispose of, but it's going to become much more wealthy uh, and it's going to become much more of a status symbol. And having and controlling copper is going to be the secret of power. And I think that around 1900 BC, maybe 1950, uh, the, 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 the first proper elites emerged by controlling the increasingly uh, scarce resource. <clears throat> whether these elites are actually copper workers themselves or whether they're just tough guys who step in and say, copper worker, you, you work for me now, uh, is a moot point. It could be one or the other. But what certainly the case is, is that all of a sudden they start to, to show their power uh, through the first true personal weapons uh, in the Irish uh, archaeological record. Uh, I mean, you can, anybody can take an axe and whack someone over the head with it. Uh, you can take a flint knife and, and, and cut them with it. But when you have a beautiful dagger, like the one from County Clare shown below, it is only one real function, and that is a, a weapon. Uh, there is the halberds, which people talk about, but I think most people agree that halberds are only much just the ceremonial context. Uh, they, they, they couldn't have been used as, as, as an everyday weapon. Their shape's just wrong and they're not well enough secured to the, the pole. But this is an actual personal weapon that you can wield. And it's a beautiful personal weapon. Remember, copper, when it's new and polished, looks like gold. So this is a, a beautiful personal weapon. It's a symbol of adornment. It's a symbol of power. And you get these, uh, this is a, you get uh, daggers like this turning up in graves uh, across Ireland. There are five or six cemeteries in which there are uh, uh, class three, as they're sometimes called, daggers showing Breton influence. These are the same type of daggers that you get in the Wessex culture uh, in, in, in Southwest England, which is another area where there's an explosion of early Bronze Age uh, culture, if you like, and it's another area where, which was dependent on Irish copper. <clears throat> so the idea that not just in Ireland, but also in uh, England, and Scotland, and Wales, there was the emergence of chiefdoms who, uh, who grew up because of the sudden constriction in copper supply uh, uh, is, is not impossible. Uh, there is a, a principle, a theory, well, it's a principle or a theory, I don't know which really, a, a thing called peer polity interaction in between the two in, in archaeological thought, which uh, suggests that whenever you do have areas in regular competition, not regular competition, regular contact, that they will start to observe what the other cultures doing and emulate and compete. You can see that in modern ways I mean, during the Cold War, how much the Soviets and the Russians used to compete over the same types of things, the Olympics, chess, uh, the space race, the missile race. They start to resemble each other, even if they started out significantly different. And I think during the early Bronze Age, we quickly see this sort of emergence of similar chiefdoms across these islands uh, in response to uh, uh, the Ross Island, Ross Island uh, copper collapse. It does seem that there's quite a while before new uh, copper sources are found as well. Uh, there are copper mines coming into production in Wales, but probably not for a couple of hundred years after uh, the, the, the collapse of Ross Island. So the only other way was for copper to be brought from uh, continental Europe. Uh, that pr probably hasn't been able to happen at scale and probably hasn't been able to happen immediately after the uh, collapse of Ross Island uh, production. So 
coming to the end. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear, for those of you that are still left. Uh, metal working, uh, appearing in Ireland around 2500 BC-ish, widely traded into Scotland, and it's this uh, trading into Scotland, uh, coming into contact with the bigger tradition, which is probably what brings this whole new single burial tradition uh, back into Ireland. Uh, this is an example of what uh, is sometimes discussed. Uh, David Anthony, very good sort of archaeological stroke anthropological thinker, talks about counter stream migration. Sometimes people think that you know, you identify a migration by looking and seeing what pots or what metalwork the migrants have brought to the new area. And that's sometimes the way you can see migrations. But actually, very often migrations are noticeable, not for the things that the migrants bring to the new country, but for the things that the migrants bring back to the old country. And uh, sometimes archaeologists have to be very careful when using migration as an explanatory uh, an explanatory explanation that doesn't, that doesn't work right. That's <laughs> an explanatory narrative uh, because it's it's very easy to see the appearance of an artifact and say, oh, that means people must have moved. But you can sort of think how the you, uh, future archaeologists can easily imagine that the profusion of Coca Cola uh, was the evidence for a huge American migration in the 1960s to Western Europe, but it's always much more subtle than that. Uh, so we have to be careful about how we think about migration. Uh, but uh, we can also say, I think, that in the early phases, this was a, a, a tribal society. It was not a band. It was much more sophisticated than that, with a lot of specialization. The very fact that there's metalworking alone and various different types of metalworking and mining and a metal distribution <clears throat> and all the other crafts uh, show that this was a, a society with a great deal of specialization. And I think we could see in phase B, especially, the evidence of that specialization and the increasing burial complexity but without in phase B evidence for uh, an actual established uh, elite. Uh, phase C, I think, however, does show that uh, change into proper chiefdoms, things that look like a proper aristocratic societies, where there's a warrior elite, where the warriors have weapons, uh, or, or, or either, either their own personal weapons or for soldiers in their employ. And then uh, I think it's a reasonable case to make that it's a supply crisis caused by the decline of Ross Island, which starts a domino effect at creating a uh, similar, uh, not tribal, but I put tribal there, uh, a domino effect on creating other uh, chieftain type societies across Ross Island's material hinterland, if you like, which is basically the islands of Ireland and Britain. So that's about that. If you have any other questions, uh, I'd love to take them, but if there's anybody that hasn't had to go back to work yet, <laughs> I'm going to try and zoom out of uh, SlideShare and go back to, no, go back to video perhaps. How do I do that? Let me see, so it's one second. Uh, oh, begin to realise my lack of knowledge of uh, Zoom. Oh, we zoomed out. Hi, Cormac. Are you still? Uh, oh no, still here. I can't see. Can you see me? Still there. Can I do? Can I you can see, see me? You. Yes. Yes, well, I can see you. Yes, I'm indeed. I'm, ha I'm happy to take any questions if if I can answer them. Uh, you were just going to say that we've just got we've gone we, and our, I'm getting messages here that the link is going to close. Oh right, there. that's okay. If you want to even give a, a, a um, if you're happy to a, a email address or something, if anyone Absolutely. has any comments. Um, Sorry, it's just that's you can the see the I just there. I it's, just realised the time. It went on for quite a long time. <laughs> I, just, I, don't, I don't want you to get cut off completely. No, no, that's thank okay. you very much. It was a fascinating that's lecture. Okay. My my, e my email address is. It's very simple, c.maxfarren at qub.ac.uk. And if anyone wants to uh, email me, that's absolutely fine. If you can't remember that, just put my name into Google with Queens or QUB and you'll get to my web page and it has a link to my email on it. So I'm more than happy to take any emails. There should be a recording of this, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll share it with Deborah and she can host it. Uh, and I'll also maybe put it up on YouTube if I can find a way of doing that. And uh, you're more than welcome uh, to view it. 
I don't think there are too many uh, copyright uh, copyrighted images on there. Uh, if there are, hopefully nobody will notice them. Uh, <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, uh, everybody.